Hey, everybody. I, um, I'm joined today by Dr. Timothy Clary. Uh, Dr. Clary is uh, with ICR, and he is um, professionally trained as a geologist. Is that correct? That's correct. So, um, and we're going to talk today about dinosaurs. I know that dinosaurs are one of these topics that that comes up often in this group, and um, uh, just our worldview uh, versus a secular worldview that maybe you grew up with or are used to. Um, so thank you for joining me today, Dr. Clary. I'm excited My to pleasure. have you here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Because I find I find it fascinating. Well, I was trained in, in a lot of secular schools, but I was always a young earth creationist going through. I heard Dwayne Gish speak a few times as I was going to college, but I went into geology uh, because I was always fascinated by science. And geology is one of those sciences where you're looking at a lot of interesting data. You get to go out and collect the data in the field a lot. And so I really, the attraction to geology, I don't know, maybe it was God-given or something, but I really enjoy studying about the earth and the history of the earth. It kind of combines my love of history, I guess, with the, with the earth. And then with the biblical story the, in the Bible, the, you know, the historical accounts in Genesis, it, it all just made sense. The problem is when you go to secular schools, you're only taught evolution and deep time and millions of years. And so I had to keep myself grounded in some of the seminal works of like Henry Morris and others and Dwayne Gish and get to hear them speak a few times while I was going to school to kind of keep myself focused because the, what the secular science will teach you is, is much of uh, they they won't tell you the full story they only tell you their story their version of the story so I went on and actually got a master's I needed to get a master's I never thought I'd work full-time in Christian <laughs> ministry uh, I thought I'd have a career in oil and gas I got hired with Chevron worked for Chevron for almost nine years and oil prices crashed so much they laid me off and that was the reason why I went back and got my PhD in geology and spent another three and a half years working on that. And, wow. and that allowed me to get this job at ICR ultimately. They like to have PhDs to show that we have real scientists in our staff. Uh, but I worked for 17 years as a full-time college professor. In that time, I put together this introductory dinosaur book uh, or class that I didn't have a book for. And I couldn't talk about the Bible. I couldn't talk about the art. But I could talk about how dinosaurs show no evidence of any evolution in the rock record. So, so there are some things I could say, mm -hmm. but I could say what I really wanted to say. So this book that I, when I finally left there and came to ICR, the book on dinosaurs that I put together, really a labor of love. I put together love, my love of dinosaurs with my love of geology, and obviously you know, my love of the Lord, and tied it all together and showed how dinosaurs really do fit in the Bible. There actually are dinosaurs described in the Bible. They just don't use the word dinosaur because the word dinosaur wasn't invented until after the Bible was translated. Uh, but to me, it's it's been a fascinating journey, and I see God's hand on it. And at 52, a few years ago, I came to ICR, and I feel like I finally got called to do and use the skills I learned in oil and gas, use the skills that I, you know, learned teaching kind of an introductory level courses, use the skills of learning to dig dinosaurs and all about the dinosaurs and keeping up on the different types of dinosaurs. All kind of came together to put together this book and, and the research that I'm doing today. And at the end of the book, even it shows how dinosaurs fit in the rock record. And that's the thing I'm continuing. I'm working on, I have four continents done now showing the rocks across four continents and how they all show a global flood. Wow. By dinosaurs are found only in certain rocks. You know, they're not found in the early flood layers. They're only found part way up as the water kept going up. Eventually it flooded their environment. And then that's where they were buried in a certain, you know, the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous rocks they're called. And that's really kind of midway through the flood. Interesting. All right. So the um, if you're just for anybody who's just joining us, I'm I'm talking with Dr. Timothy Clary, and he is the author of the book Dinosaurs, Marvels of God's Design. This is the Bible of Dinosaurs. If you're interested, there's just some fascinating information if you have questions. But as long as we have the opportunity to bring him in and ask him directly, I wanted to do that. Now, he is with the ministry um, ICR, which stands for Institute of Creation Research. Is that correct? Institute for Creation Research, but for close creation. enough. Okay. Um, close and and we, we kind of have some roots here because ICR was founded by Dr. Henry Morris, mm -hmm. and uh, so is Master Books. And Master Books came under New Leaf Publishing Group about 20 years ago, uh, but we publish a lot of uh, Dr. Henry Morris's materials, and he was really what we would say was kind of the father of the modern creation science movement. Can you tell us a little bit, Dr. Clary, about the ICR? What what do you do as an organization, and and um, what's the ministry there? 
Well, we try to confirm the truth of the Bible with science. And so we have about eight, uh, our scientist staff fluctuates a little bit. We have about eight or nine full-time scientists, I think, on staff right now. Um, some of the guys do it kind of part-time and do other things. But uh, most of us, all, almost all of us have PhDs from secular universities. And we're all doing active research, trying to, you know, show people that God's word is true. And so I tell people I have the best job in the world because I get to go around telling people there really was a global flood. The research I'm looking at is, you know, sediments across all these continents all over the world. And we're, again, four continents in. We, they keep showing a very consistent pattern that the flood rose all at the same time and went down at the same time. And to me, it's just it's very exciting. That's what ICR is all about. That Henry Morris founded. It was really, we're here to confirm the Bible. You know, that science confirms the Bible exactly what it says. That it really was a global flood. It really was a creation just thousands of years ago, probably around 6,000 years ago. And that's... That's, we've been in existence for almost 50 years now, and I just feel privileged to be part of it the last six. Yeah. Now, so I want to make sure everybody knows that ICR does have speakers that go and speak to churches and groups and conferences. And so if, if you would be interested in having Dr. Clary speak to your group or church, um, they would go to, it's ICR's website. ICR.org, and then look up. Schedule an event. There's a spot that says schedule an event. Okay. And then contact contacts our events department and they hook it all up. You can request speakers like myself or, or anybody else. So we've got biologists. We've got uh, we actually have a Brian Thomas recently got his PhD. He's actually a bio does paleo biochemistry. Wow. He's looking at all the soft tissues that he discovered. And we discussed that in the dinosaur book as well. That some of the evidence in the dinosaur bones themselves that show they're really young. So we have, he's dedicating basically his research to that. We have guys working on genetics and physics and nuclear physics. We have a, a new nuclear physicist that came out right about the same time I did. And he's been putting out books as well and the resources through ICR and trying to show that these methods of the day trim of the old earth really are all tainted. They're all tainted by assumptions that can't be verified. So I talk a little bit about that in my dinosaur books that I did. Some of those topics are important to show people the dinosaurs really are not that old. Yeah, yeah. Now, so you had said you taught in a secular university, right? It wasn't a Christian university. It was secular? No, no. It's a public, yeah, it's a public school, public college, yeah. Okay, for 17 years, and yeah. you, you have your Ph.D. in geology. Would you consider yourself to be a legitimate scientist? Well, uh, yes. I mean, I still think I'm doing science. The, the one problem, ironically, is once I joined ICR, a lot of the people that considered me a, you know, fairly decent geologist, and I could find oil, and you know, I could publish papers, like publish secular papers. As soon as I joined ICR, I became a non-scientist in the views of many people. Yeah, and yeah. So they're just like, well, what happened to Clary? You know, what, why did he go off the deep end? That sort of attitude. But right now, I'm doing some of the most exciting science I've ever done, and it's to me, it's showing that the, the flood was real, and it wasn't just a little local flood; it was global. And yeah. that's why you see dinosaurs in the same sort of, you know, level all over the world. It's because that environment is being buried at the same time all over the world. Yeah. And the same high point. I mean, all Everybody, we dropped you in the middle of this uh, interview, and sorry about that. Um, so the question that I had just posed to uh, Dr. Timothy McClary, or Clary, I'm sorry, who had been 17 years in a public university teaching geology was if he considered himself a real scientist. And so I'm going to have him pick up there. Um, if, if, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go on. I don't know how much we picked up before we got cut off, but a lot of my secular colleagues, ever since I joined ACR, they basically said, you're no longer a scientist. I mean, it's, it's that simple. I published papers, I've given talks, you know, the guys at the school, Western Michigan, where I went to college, got my PhD. They said, your PhD is probably the best PhD has come out of our school. You know, and I've always had real high grades, and I've always graduated pretty much first in my class everywhere I've gone, Wyoming or Western Michigan, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, so they know I've, I've done well in, academically, and, you know, my papers. I published several, several, you know, pretty long papers on some certain topics. It was tough because I was teaching at a community college. I didn't have time to do a lot of research, but I did do some. And so there was never a question about me being a scientist until suddenly I joined ICR. <laughs> I'm saying I don't have that worldview anymore of, you know, the secular worldview and evolution and billions of years. I now, you know, show people that the earth is young, the dinosaurs are young, and, the, you know, the soft tissues and the proteins and the collagens and the blood vessels, 
that we're finding in these dinosaurs, to me, is as much proof as you can get in geology to show these things are young. Yeah. And so, but it's it's kind of ironic because as soon as I joined ICR, they said, "Oh, you're no longer a scientist," and I kind of get <laughs> marginalized and pushed off. And I still go to the conferences every year, and I see some of my former professors, and some of them are cool about it. You know, others are just like they don't even want to talk to me. Yeah. Well, we've seen the same thing with um, Nathaniel Jensen, who I, was a yeah, colleague, he, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah he, I see a few years back. Yeah, and he had he graduated with a PhD from Harvard, but the moment he published work stating that young Earth creationists, then then that degree absolutely it meant nothing. You know, I mean, it was like, oh, he doesn't belong here anymore. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah I didn't, just because you don't agree, yeah, it's, it's me, crazy. Hey, Jensen and myself, I think you know we're both doing some of the best research that's you know going on currently out there in the, in the creation world. We're and it's and it's not so much me doing it; it's God's using me. And right. So I don't want to think. I don't want to make it all about me. You know, God loved me to get good grades. God loved me to do these things. He brought me through all this path. And ultimately, I, like I was saying, I think earlier at 52, he kind of called me out from the secular world and said, "We got a better job for you to do. Yeah. You know, we, we can provide information for the next generation, the next generation of people, kind of like Henry Morris did and Dwayne Gish did. And so to me, I'm, this is kind of like my second chance. I, I almost feel like Jonah. But I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do, so God laid me off, which kind of forced me to get a PhD from the oil company, and then and I was just kind of hanging out there too long, and I should have probably come to ICR sooner or some Christian ministry sooner, but ultimately God's plan, he has a plan for everybody, and he, he brought it full circle, and here I am now, and I'm trying to do what I can to, to show that God's word really is true. So true. Me, I'm, I am the same story here. Um, hey, what... When it comes to dinosaurs, um, why? What's what's the big deal with dinosaurs, especially in relation to a Christian? Like, why as a Christian should I care about dinosaurs? Well, so many people are fascinated by them. And you, and you see so many movies about dinosaurs, and the kids are fascinated by them. And, and everybody, you know, they've done studies, and they show that people kind of peak, you know, in, in their love of dinosaurs and the names. And they know all the names around the age six or seven, maybe eight years old. But even young, young kids, and even you know, 80, 90 year olds, everybody's fascinated by dinosaurs. And everybody wonders because they don't use the word dinosaur in the Bible. They wonder, well, did God create these dinosaurs? Did they go extinct before the flood? Were they on the ark? And so as I go out around the country, I have many, many questions by a lot of Christian people. They really want to know. And that's one of the reasons I wrote this book was to tell people, yes, God did create dinosaurs. And he had a purpose for the diversity of them and, and all the different types of dinosaurs. But a lot of them are just the same kinds over and over and over, and that's what you've got to keep in mind. There's really not, you know, 1,500 species. There's only maybe 60, 70, maybe, you know, maybe a few kind of, of kinds of dinosaurs. And they're all really the same types of things. Okay, okay. I'm probably covering too much. We get a little carried away. <laughs> that's, I, well, I, I say when a person is passionate about something, it's hard to keep them quiet. Um, but they, you know, they did fit on the ark. There weren't that many to fit on. And, you know, like I say, the old guy probably brought juveniles on the ark as well before they hit the big growth spurt. Every dinosaur, most animals have a slow growth and then they take off really rapidly, like we do in our teenage years. And that's probably God brought them on the ark before they hit that big growth spurt. And so then when they got off the ark, they were able to eat a lot and then grow fast and, and reproduce and fill the earth like God told them to do. Well, the, backing up a little bit, why? Why do you believe thousands of years versus millions of years? What what evidence do you have, or or what really leads you to believe that worldview? Well, the lot, the strongest evidence in the last oh, since two thousand five has been the discovery of soft tissues in dinosaur bones, and one of the first discoveries was by Mary Schweitzer in a T Rex, Tyrannosaurus Rex thigh bone, a femur bone. They broke open by accident. She dissolved too much of the bone away in some acids. You know, it was all this soft, squishy stuff. So she was like pulling it apart. It was stretching like a rubber band. Mm. And in 60 minutes, uh, you know, we show that clip a lot a, a year later. And, and uh, Jack Corner, her former advisor at Montana State, who's a, an old earth, you know, secular guy, he's like, well, it's impossible. You know, they can't have this. And they, they, so they've been struggling since 2005, but yet there's been over 100 papers, 100 secular papers that have discovered more and more and more and more. Some of these go back to, but they're finding some organic material in rocks that are supposed to be a billion years old now. It shows like chitin. And they're finding soft worms that are supposed to be a half a billion years old. Half a billion, 500 million years old. And so dinosaurs, you know, they find blood vessels now. They confirm them with other tests. Blood vessels that go back about 190 million years. And, 
you know, the T-Rex that they discovered originally is supposed to be 68 million years. And so the question is, how can these materials, these proteins, and these, you know, cells, red blood cell-like things, they call them, they don't want to admit it, but others they've had, you know, they found osteocyte cells and things. How can these things be millions of years old when none of these can survive that long? Yeah. None of these can survive even a million years. And, you know, the physical chemists have shown these things decay. It doesn't matter where they're at. And these are right near the surface where they find these bones that have been frozen and thawed and frozen and thawed like a Wyoming and Montana. Not the best conditions, but yet they're still there. So they, they can't be millions of years old. To me, this is as close to proof as you can get in geology. Why do you think that the secular world, I mean, they just won't change the worldview? Is that why they won't accept Well, that's that, that's else? the biggest problem is they, you know, they, they built this big, I don't know if you want to call it, almost, almost like the emperor's new clothes thing, where they don't want to ever admit that they're wrong. And because if they change that, then their whole worldview falls apart, and then they have to realize, okay, there was a creator, there was a God, I'm responsible to him, not just myself. And so there's so much of the secular science, particularly of geology, has been built around atheism. You know, even a lot of Christians that get involved in it. A lot of them are old earth geologists. Most of the guys I worked with that were Christians were old earth. They, they bought into the stories about the, the you know, great ages of the earth, but now I think God has revealed to us through these dinosaur soft tissues this really wasn't that long ago, but yet there's still some journals that refuse to even accept papers now, like the Society of Vertebrate Paleontologists. Their journals won't even won't even accept the paper; they just reject it without even reviewing it. So they they still think that there's some magical way, by some miracle, which they don't want to call it that, these things were able to be preserved much longer than what we can demonstrate. Yeah. So they they insist that these they're still old because we know they are, but yet. You know, in spite of the data, they use, they're kind of basically uh, called on miracles to preserve these things. So you know, they don't want to believe in miracles. Right, right. <laughs> so, it's still ironic, but yet you know they don't they don't they don't give up because they've built their whole life around you know billions of years and millions of years, and so they're like it just can't be. Just we don't know how these things are preserved. That's their argument, but yet they keep finding every year there's several more that are found and published, and it just it, it's got to bother them. To, to us, this is like, this is awesome. You know, Jack Conner even said the creationists are going to love this because he knew the implications. But a lot of the you know, scientists out there, they don't even want to bring it up. They don't bring up the implications. If they mention them, they'll say, oh, there's chemical fossils now. That's kind of cool. Yeah. But they don't they don't talk about how they can't be that old. And, and in my old field of oil and gas, we used to talk about oil that was 150 million years old and moved across Wyoming and just sitting there waiting for us to drill. But oil is also organic. It's made from mostly marine algae. Oil itself can't be old. So we've got billions and billions of barrels of this material that was buried in the flood rocks and matured to oil by the, you know, the Earth's sort of internal heat, providing energy for us to make our plastics and oil and gasoline, etc. cetera. Uh, and all that is material that, as you know, when you spill it, bacteria eats it all up. And there's bacteria underground. So it's amazing as any oil, let alone all the huge oil deposits we do have. It, it just can't be millions of years old either. Wow, that's interesting. I, I say often in this group that science is the pursuit of truth. It's not mm -hmm. truth. And a lot of times science, secular science will portray itself as being truth and mm -hmm. that it supersedes the absolute truth of God's word, which we know from just watching science, the track record of science, it's not truth. It's always changing. So I think that that's, that's, Awesome, you know, recent discoveries. It's not just past discoveries. These are pretty recent discoveries that are pointing to the truth of God's word. Amen to that. It's, I ask my students all the time, I used to ask, at the, at the Christian college I teach at part time, I say, what is truth? And they're like, well, science. I'm like, no, <laughs> science is not the truth. God's word is all the truth we have. Yep. Yep. All you got to do is watch TV for a little while when an ad comes up and says, if you or someone you know has been injured by, just insert science because that's pretty much what it brought you, you know. So, um, so with I, I have as a geologist. This is I grew up in a public school setting, and then I transferred into a private school. But I was originally taught in general earth science about earth, um, the layers, the the rock layers, and how each layer represented an age. And you found early life forms in the in the you know, lower levels and then so forth going up. Could you talk about that? Because I know sure. for a lot of us that just have that seed planted, it would be helpful to kind of hear it from a, from
from this perspective? Right, that's, that's the research I'm really involved in, and that's what really helped me finish up the dinosaur book, to kind of see why certain fossils are found in certain layers only. So early in the, in the, in the rock layers, the Cambrian particularly, is, a, is a still a problem for the secular world, because the Cambrian, as they call it, which was named over by Cambrian, and that's where they get the name, and Devonian for Devonshire, and Ura for the, the Jurassic, and the Ura Mountains. But those names are there to identify a certain rock layers that contain a certain suite of fossils. And so as the fossils change, they put different names on them. So we can still use those names kind of uh, qualitatively, but uh, just don't, the, the numbers, the ages they put on those much later. So they went back in when they started doing age days it was later, but the, the rocks themselves are laid down in a, in a pretty definable global order. Mm -hmm. It's because as the waves were coming in, the tsunami wave that were kind of being generated by the movements of the plates and things that we believe happened during the flood real rapidly, but the work of John Baumgartner, these waves came in and kind of flooded across the land. There's huge sands that covered North America. It's, almost, it's called a blanket sand. For okay. secular science, struggles to explain how you can get the same sandstone from all the way up from the Midwest, Michigan, my home state, and New York, your home state, mm -hmm. all the way out of Texas and all the way around the Grand Canyon, all the way up Montana, all the way across you know, the Black Hills, into, into Canada even. It's the same sandstone layer. It contains all, the Cambrian has that explosion of life. For some of there's all these fossils. Below that, there's almost, you know, just stromatolites and algae-like fossils. There's very few uh, shelled fossils or anything, and it just suddenly shows up. So that's evidence of the beginning of the flood, we think. Uh, so the rocks really do support a flood uh, as you go along. And as you work your way up, as the flood got higher and the waves became higher, you get different environments. But early on, it's all mar shallow marine critters. They're just flooding shallow seas that apparently were on the, on the continents in many cases, especially a lot of North America. Okay. And that's the research I'm working on to kind of put together the free flood world based on how the rocks were deposited. You're going to fill the lowest areas first, and then you kind of work your way up. As you work your way up, eventually there's a point where suddenly a lot of coal forms from the plants you're ripping off the land, and that's when the land animal will all show up almost all at the same time. It's not a coincidence that plants and animals show up almost simultaneously globally. And so they give different names to these rocks, and that's kind of the Pennsylvanian, some of the names you might have heard about Pennsylvanian. And then you get to the Triassic, where you start seeing some dinosaurs showing up globally, and then you get to the Jurassic, you get to Cretaceous. And I think that's the point in the world, according to my research, that's the high point of the water, which is around the end of the Cretaceous. Okay. And you kind of went over the top at that point, and then you wash the animals back down. As the water receded, you're dumping a lot of material on top of the dinosaurs, but you kind of buried them all the way up. So is fossilization and, happening during the 40 days? Well, I actually went 150 days. So if you read through the flood account, the water rose for 150 days. And so the 40 days was a lot of rain. Okay. And it started to flood the land. I think after 40 days, that's when you start, it talks about the ark starts to float on day 40. And I think that's when you see the land fossils start to really show up. But they're always mixed with okay. marine. You know, even the dinosaurs in the Hell Creek Formation in Montana, there's six species of sharks now found with the T Rexes. And there's Coelacanth awesome. fish found with, with the spinosaurs in Morocco that are car sized coelacanths. And they go, oh, those must have been freshwater fish. And all oh, those, you know, sharks must have all been freshwater sharks. And those rays all must have been freshwater rays. And those herring were all freshwater herring. You hear this on and on and on because they won't give up on their story, but yeah. the data supports a mixing of the environments. Wow. Now, is it true that they find like sea fossils on top of Mount Everest? Yes, they, they do. Actually, uh, my colleague here, John Morris, uh, the son of the founder of Henry Morris of ICR, actually showed me a fossil. It's about this big around of a ammonite that was found right near the top. And it, most of the mountains of the world all formed late in the flood. So they, the water didn't go 26,000 feet high. You know, it probably maybe went four or 5,000 feet at the most to the highest hills. Yeah. But most of the world's mountains all formed late. They were pushed up at the very end of the flood after most of the sediments were deposited. And so it's, it's, and that's another mystery to the secular scientists. Why are 80% of the world's mountains all formed at once you know, in the Cenozoic or the tertiary, whatever you want to call it? Late, which we believe is late in the flood when the water was receding. We actually, why, okay. why, it's like a couple other mountain ranges like the Ural and the Appalachians that formed early in the flood. Mm -hmm. But most of those mountains all formed at the end. That's interesting. Um, we just recently went to the Grand Canyon with my family and celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. And um, the congratulations! Thank you. That that yeah. That, talk about miracles. 
<laughs> My wife's a saint. Um, the uh, the amazing thing, Canyon Ministries gave us a tour, and I was kind of blown away because he's like, I, you know, we talked about the process of the Canyon forming and everything, and he's like, he just he kind of blew my mind with like what you're talking about who said any of this was even here pre-flood yeah. none of this even probably looked anything right. like this pre-flood right all those sediments you know the five thousand feet of sediments you see in grand canyon pretty much were all deposited actually early in the flood you know most of the, they only show rocks in grand canyon and they only go up to about permian which is really about the point where the water started to flood in the land and so you see some land animals in the uppermost layers, but you don't see dinosaurs. And that's one of the complaints the secular scientists have, is why are there dinosaurs in Grand Canyon rocks? Mm -hmm. and you know, my answer to that is if you look at the oil well data, you see that they didn't flood the land. The land was being flooded early in the flood. You're flooding just areas that were shallow seas, and, and Grand Canyon was an area that was near the edge of the continent. It was a shallow sea. There's just marine fossils. That's what you see in Grand Canyon. To the very top, you start to see a few land animals that were washed in. Wow. Uh, but I believe the land was to the north and west. And I actually kind of able to use my data set to draw maps of the pre flood world. And Grand Canyon's in the water. That's why there's no dinosaurs. You didn't flood everything right away. Okay. You know, some people have said that in the past. Other creation geologists have said everything flooded right away. But uh, my research is showing that it was just like it says in Genesis. It was a progressive flood, a very violent flood, very catastrophic, not like filling up your bathtub, but it was progressive. And it took about 150 days, the Bible says, to get to the top. So it was a kind of a long, slow, painful judgment. But initially, it was all just marine things. And then it became land and marine, then more land and marine, then you know, different types of things. Eventually, you got to the point where mammals were being deposited on top of the dinosaurs, even. Okay. Now, can I ask why why don't we see dinosaurs today? If they were on the ark and they came off, why why don't we see them today? All in the book. No. <laughs> it's in there. Well, I try to speculate. Some of that, obviously, without data, you have to make more speculation. But it's that lack of data uh, out there. But there's a lot of evidence that dinosaurs did live with humans for a long time. There's lots of carvings and paintings and pictographs and. And there's even references in the book of Job to what we believe are dinosaurs, the behemoth, the leviathan, or probably some type of dinosaur. Okay. And so there's other writings that talk about dinosaurs. The Egyptians have carved to look like dinosaurs. There's a lot of ancient artwork that looks like a lot of dinosaurs. And I believe they eventually went extinct because of, I hate to use this word, climate change. Mm -hmm. Climate change after the flood, pre-flood world was probably much different than the post-flood world in terms of the amount of oxygen and CO2 in the air. And we see that by, based on fossils. We see, you know, two foot wide dragonflies that can't exist today in the fossil record. So we know there was probably more oxygen and probably, you know, it was probably a global greenhouse in the pre-flood world. Okay. Today, see that, you know, there was a lot of, there was an ice age that came out after the flood and there was all this cooler climate. And, and I believe dinosaurs, I talked about in my book, were most likely cold blooded, like reptiles today. And they struggled to survive. They couldn't grow as big or as fast. Yeah, some of these big dinosaurs that we see, the 131 foot long ones, they were probably, they might have been seven, 800 years old. And so just like humans were living to that age, dinosaurs are probably living for hundreds of years as well. Okay. Interesting. So when, when we talk about like the skeptics, right? Some, a family member doesn't believe, or it's the first time that they're actually hearing even the, the thought that maybe dinosaurs lived with humans that they're not that old what would be your main or your biggest kind of comeback to the skeptic like what would be your go-to have you considered moment well there's a couple of art things i put one in my book there's one of the there's one of the best pieces of art that i've seen is this what appears to be a stegosaurus carving from over in southeast asia and it's from about the 11th to 12th century i have to check the year exactly to me we didn't even know as paleontology people or geologists that stegosaurus plates stuck up for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, many people start to say they were laying down. You know, the fossil it wasn't clear, but this shows clearly a stegosaurus with its plate sticking up, just like a fan shape. And this was carved over a thousand years ago. And so, to me, there's a few pieces of artifacts like that that are just compelling, and they can't be ignored. And they, it, it isn't just that's like a mythical creature. They have above and below it are like monkeys and lions and, and real animals. There's no reason this isn't a real animal either. And so 
I used to tell my psychic this year, it wouldn't surprise me if there's still a dinosaur living out there today somewhere in the Congo. I, I doubt it, but it's possible. We found living fossils, as they're called, of the coelacanth. Where the last fossil of coelacanth was in the Cretaceous, same as the dinosaur, and yet it's still swimming deep in the oceans today. Okay. We found, you know, we found plants in Australia that are supposed to go on extinction in the Jurassic, and they're still living today. Uh, but unfortunately, dinosaurs were a little different. They had to live on land. I think a lot of the humans were, you know, killing off what they called dragons and things like that in the, in the Middle Ages. Okay. Uh, but I, my go-to one is probably that, the carvings, a couple of the carvings that look really like dinosaurs. And the description of the Bible, particularly the book of Job about the behemoth, to me, describes perfectly a sauropod. And it even ate grass. And for many years, people, skeptics complained like, well, this can't be a dinosaur. There was no grass. You know, they didn't believe grass evolved until later when we see fossils, but then they found fossilized dung in 2005 in India, five types of grass associated with sauropod or long-necked dinosaurs, just probably like what they're describing in the Book of Job. So to me, that confirms the Bible again. You know, why do people doubt and are skeptical? Yeah. The Bible's shown to be true. So as a geologist, I'm going to ask you, um, hoping you can answer me. In New York, and we lived in western New York, um, south of like Buffalo, Niagara Falls area, uh, there's the Allegheny Mountains. And on the top of some of the mountains, there's they, they call it Rock City. But there's a row of houses like perfectly aligned along the ridge of the top of this one mountain. And these rocks are the size of a house. I mean, they're they're just mammoth, and there's probably 50 of them all in a line, like they were brought up by a huge wave and laid down, you know, kind of like what you'd see seashells on the beach. Mm -hmm. And and when you walk into them, because you, you go up there in the woods and you can just hang out up there, and as you're walking, you can actually see, like, there's watermarks and, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's seashells in it and everything. Uh, I was always taught that that area, it was from the Ice Age and the glaciers and kind of the glacial melt there, and that was the moraine that was left. Um, was the Ice Age a real event? And do you have any thoughts on, on that phenomenon? Well, well, those would be called glacial erratics. You know, those are probably pieces of flood rocks if they contain fossils. And most of what was deposited in the New York area where there was a lot of shallow marine area, just like my home state of Michigan. Mm -hmm. So those pieces are probably ripped up and transported. And, and the glaciers definitely left their mark across New York and Michigan, Wisconsin, those areas. But it wasn't until about 1870s, 1880s that anybody believed in an ice age whatsoever until they looked at the cumulative amount of data. And they said, there must have been thick ice here. And you could go to Michigan and see lake levels, the terraces in um, the northern part of the lower peninsula, we could see different lake levels where the water had gone up and down during the ice age as the water, as the ice receded, melted, the land actually rebounds, comes up hundreds of feet. Really? And so it's probably leftover moraines. Long Island actually has a moraine where the glaciers kind of stopped temporarily and dumped a lot of debris that's, as they moved down. But after see. the flood, there was this ice age that occurred probably maybe less than 700 years total and peaked about 500 years or so maybe after the flood. But the reason for that was the flood. We made all this new ocean crust all over the world, we believe, during catastrophic plate tectonics. Yeah. Rapid, rapid make it seem all that ocean crust was lava. So it heated the water considerably, maybe 20, 30 degrees Celsius hotter. And Mike Cord's done a lot of work on this. I know he's published with you guys a few times. Yep. And the, what happened is the water was hot, so you get a lot of evaporation. But there are all the volcanoes, not only were the Mountains forming at the end of the flood, but the volcanoes were peaking. Yellowstone super volcano and all these different volcanoes were erupting into the like the Eocene, the early Cenozoic. And all that volcanic ash was in the sky cooling the earth. So for hundreds of years, you have multiple volcanoes erupting, erupting. We see the evidence in the rocks today. And you also have hot oceans, so a lot of evaporation coming up. And in the north, it came down as snow. And then snow over many years. If it doesn't melt, it becomes ice, and you can build up big ice sheets within a few hundred years. But why was that important? Because God needed a way, he had a plan to lower sea level by taking all that snow and ice and building it up so thick that he lowered sea level, made land bridges, so you could walk from Turkey to virtually every continent on the earth. There was a small window of time, maybe two or three hundred years, when you could have walked from Siberia and across you know, the, the Bering Sea right over to Alaska and then down to South America, you can walk to Africa from Turkey, you can walk. Anyway, the only place you had to do a little bit of swimming 
it was Australia, a couple of the islands, there was a little gap. And so you have some unique animals that end up in Australia. That's fascinating. Without, without that lowering of sea level, without that plan that God had all along of the conditions of the flood making, the conditions of the ice age, and having an ice age come and go, we would never be able to repopulate the world with yeah. the animals that we see today. How would the mammoths get to North America, for example, or the mastodons, if they didn't have land bridges to get there? That's and, fascinating. Right? Any for that matter. Yeah, yeah. Got a plan. To me, it's just amazing. I see you know, his hand in all the activity of the flood, all the chaos of the flood, but yet he still provided you know, oil and coal resources for our, our current generation. He provided a way for the animal to get back. I mean, he had it all figured out, and we're just, you know, we're learning this much of God's wisdom. And system to me, it just it blows me away that what he had planned, and still things that we're finding that it's just like he knew this all along. You know, he he had a plan, even in the chaos and judgment of the flood. Yeah, he had a plan not only for to restore the earth, but he had a plan for his, you know, himself coming to earth ultimately as Jesus and and, and died on the cross, and he had a plan for our salvation, from our redemption from our sinful nature started by Adam and Eve. And so we got to believe Adam and Eve are real. They were real people that lived, you know, 6,000 years ago. And the reason Jesus came along 4,000 years later is because he had to pay the price for that sin. You know, an infinite God can give us infinite salvation. Yeah. So by his shed blood, you know, it's all part of the plan. It's just, it just amazes me. And, we, and he cares about each and every one of us. He's not just a God that created things and got started and walked away. Like a lot of old earth people believe, the old earth, the estic evolutionists, they think, well, God started things, and now he just sits back in his throne. But he's involved with everything on earth. You know, he knows every hair in our head. He knows every, He knows we were going to do this before he even created the world. He knew each and every one of us. Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's amazing to think that, you know, we make God small. We also make the flood small because we can't see a flood on the, you know, a global flood has never happened since. And he promised that, but, you know, we make everything too small because we can't imagine things we haven't seen. Yeah. Well, one of the things we offer with our curriculum is what's called a faith builder guarantee, which means if the faith of your child doesn't grow as a result of using the curriculum, we'll give you your money back. And the reason that we feel safe doing that is because when we point to the truth of God's word, faith is going to grow. And even today in speaking with you, and you know, you don't realize how polluted your mind gets from secular science. When you grow up in a public school environment, and like as you're talking, I'm just, I'm, my mind is like erasing science that I know and putting new science that you're giving me in place. And I'm just like, it makes so much sense. God's word is so true. It can yeah. be it can be trusted. So um, I, based on that, I would encourage anybody, if you're interested in having Dr. Clary speak at your event or or to mm -hmm. your group, be sure to contact ICR, and it's the events page. Yeah, the event. Well, there'll be a place where they contact us or schedule a, an event. But go to icr.org, okay. and there's a schedule an event somewhere on there. Okay. Or they can contact us, you know, and say we want to schedule an event or we want to bring some people in. And yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. Okay. And then the other thing I want everybody to be sure, if you have a child who's interested in dinosaurs or a skeptic, be sure to get this book, Dinosaurs, Marvels of God's Design, because it has so much fascinating information and, and will guarantee it to grow your faith. Because as you begin to look at the evidence in light of a biblical worldview, um, it's almost impossible not to see the truth and to realize how hidden, <laughs> if you will, the truth really is from us because people just don't want you to know that there is a creator. We are accountable to that creator. We've failed that creator, but there's a hope for us in his son, Jesus Christ. So um, Dr. Clary, thank you so much for taking time to join us and to talk about the book. And um, you are in our prayers that the Lord continues to open your eyes and give you new insights and to continue to reveal um, his truth as, as you look through the rocks. And like I said, it's a pleasure to, to be able to do this and, and to be on the cutting edge to show that God's word is true and there was this flood and it did bear the dinosaurs. And, and, and it was a real, like I said earlier, it's a labor of love to put this book together because it was able to show how dinosaurs were created and then how they became violent after Adam and Eve sinned and then how they actually were, you know, 60 kinds of them at least were put on the ark and then eventually 
they even talked about how they went extinct after the flood. There was no impact, uh, crater impact to kill the dinosaurs. It was more probably a, like many species today going extinct, you know, because of long-term climate change or loss of habitat. That's kind of what happened to them as well. So. It's funny. I was just handed, and, and uh, Brittany handed me her phone, and it, one of the people said, I keep hearing evidence of a large meteor striking the earth as a reason for extinction. Mm -hmm. And you would say you wouldn't agree with that? Well, I did a big study. It's actually on Answers Research Journal. If they want to get the details. There's an article I wrote a couple of years ago. And if you go to Answers Research Journal online, look up Chicks Loop Crater or look up my name. I went through it. And most of the evidence for that actually can be reinterpreted as volcanic evidence. And most of those shot quartz and all the different things I went through and looked at every little aspect of it. And there's not enough melt there to be a big impact. And they keep drilling wells, and they keep trying to say they found this and they found that, but in reality, they haven't done much of anything. Uh, and there's no iridium there. That's one of the big, supposed to be the evidence of an impact is this iridium layer, which is hit or miss. It's not everywhere, like they try to tell you. It's not even at the site. There's like one, one spot where they found some iridium. So here's supposedly the smoking gun, and, it's, and it fizzles out, really, in my opinion. It's a wow. very little, if at all, a tiny, tiny little impact that didn't really do anything having an impact at all. And so that's one of the things that came up as a consequence of my research as I went to South America and Mexico working their way down. Uh, and unfortunately, that's out there. It's in the movies. It's in all these stories, of, you know, that there was this big impact to kill the dinosaurs. But they're trying to, they need something to explain why they went extinct. Yeah. Well, what's so, the saying? Tell like, a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, and people start to believe it. But even some of the paleontologists like Robert Bacher, he doesn't believe it. He says there's no way it would have killed everything. It would have killed all the frogs because the frogs go right across that boundary. You know they're buried above and below it. Mm -hmm. and so his opinion, even not even though he's not a Christian, he doesn't believe that the impact really caused any extinctions of, of other than you know certain dinosaurs disappear at that level right. for a different reason. And I, the reason I believe is that was the level they were buried in the flood. Wow. It's just each eco ecological zonation we call it. If the water went up higher. In very different environments. So you even see different dinosaurs at the in the Triassic, and you do the Jurassic, and you do the in the Cretaceous. Okay. And so it's very defined based on elevations. But to me, the impact was probably didn't even exist. But there's more information if they want to look that up. Okay. Uh, but I mentioned it even in the, in the dinosaur book, which I'll go in here as well, but I don't get into the details. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, just listening to you talk, you, you, I'm just fascinated that really the only truth we can believe is the truth of God's word. That's exactly. And you know, the rocks are real. The dinosaur bones are real. But it's how they're interpreted and twisted by the secular scientists. Yeah. They're only on a lot of half-truths. And so it's the so same idea, like you said, when enough half-truths add together, they think it adds up to, you know, truth. And it, and it doesn't. You know, the only truth is God's word. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and we we do appreciate it. And I'm going to put a link to ICR's uh, website in the in the comments, everybody. I hope that this was helpful. I hope that if you have questions or or maybe you're a little bit skeptical about um, young Earth creationism and the worldview that we have of the flood was real, that Adam and Eve are real people, that there were dinosaurs that existed with man that went onto the ark, um, and that the science not doesn't doesn't disprove this the science actually proves the bible is true and we are blessed to have scientists who are willing to step out on the line go against their peers and to to say this is what the evidence actually points to not what we're trying to deceive people into believing so we have a number of resources to support everything that's been spoken highly recommend <laughs> the dinosaurs marvels i got all kinds of different angles dinosaurs marvels of god's design and if you have questions, be sure to comment and we'll try to answer them as best we can. God bless you guys. Have a good afternoon.